Hello, space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Um, uh, hold on a second. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so welcome back to <clears throat> uh, Astronomy 1010. Today we're going to be learning about planetary atmospheres. A full understanding of terrestrial planets requires understanding how geology and terrestrial atmospheres come together. Am I doing something funny, Thomas, or are you laughing at something else? Sorry, it was something else. Something that was happening in the background. Sorry. That's great. As long as it's not me. Okay. <laughs> like, is there You're good. You're good. <laughs> okay. Um, that's totally cool. Laughing is allowed during the course of this presentation. Uh, let's go ahead and share a screen again. And let's take a peek at our, our opening salvo here. Uh, function F5. Um, how many of our terrestrial planets have atmospheres again? Three. I'm just trying to figure out what you guys know. Earth, Venus, and Mars. Earth, Venus, and Mars. So for today's class, um, hold on, I just want to mirror the video. Wait, which way can I actually read? I don't remember. I think if I hit mirror my video. Let me just test here. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's... I think either way it looks right for you guys. That's what looks right for me and hide non-video participants. Sorry, just some general settings getting out of the way. We are not gonna be talking about Mercury and the moon in today's class. We are still in the zone of terrestrial planets, but we are not, um, we're not ready to move past that, but we have to understand how atmospheres affect terrestrial geology and development. Class, um, what are our four geological processes? What are the four basic geological processes that determine the way a planet looks over time. You guys are supposed to have those memorized cold. Laura, do you know, or Kayla, anyone? Impact cratering, volcanism, plate tectonics, erosion. Right. And <clears throat> erosion we didn't talk about a ton last time. It comes in the form of wind, water, and ice. But Two of those things, at least, wind and water, are going to require a planetary atmosphere. Wind, for obvious reasons, but also remember, students, that there are no liquids in space, okay? Without atmospheric pressure, you cannot press water into a liquid. It's either in the form of ice, it's frozen and too cold, or if it gets too hot, it sublimates and goes directly to gas. So you can't have water erosion without an atmosphere. In some ways, our terrestrial planets are kind of like the story of Goldilocks and the three atmospheres. One is too thick, one is too thin, and our planet Earth is just right. And uh, the starting thing that we want to do here is, uh, I know I have them in my slide and this looks much nicer than my handwriting, but to signal that it's note-taking time, let's go ahead and uh, take some, sorry, class notes on our uh, terrestrial atmospheres. So we have Venus, closest to, uh, closest to the sun of the three terrestrials that have atmospheres, our planet Earth, and Mars. And we want to start with uh, atmosphere composition. Venus and Mars kind of act the same. They are, they seem the same in terms of their atmospheric content. 96% uh, I believe of Venus's atmosphere is in the form of carbon dioxide, 
maybe about 3% diatomic nitrogen, and then 1% is other stuff, uh, including argon, including <laughs> complex volatiles, and even the legendary acid rain clouds that melt spacecraft when you try to descend them into the surface of Venus. If you think about all the pictures we have of the surface of Mars, we don't have anything like that for Venus. We only have maybe two images from the surface of Venus, and I'm hoping at some point today I can show you those pictures. Um, Earth has a very peculiar atmosphere by contrast. Its atmosphere is uh, diatomic nitrogen, 77%. And here's a real weird one. Um, is this my good blue marker? Diatomic oxygen, which of course we need for respiration and metabolic processes, makes up 21% of our atmosphere. We're the only planet that seems to have a big buildup of oxygen. And, and that's not normal. That's very bizarre. Oxygen, my friends, is a violent and explosive gas. That's why our cells use it for energy. It wants to bind to things. It wants to rust metals. It wants to set things on fire. Um, and uh, then maybe, you know, 1% or 2% argon. Argon is a noble gas that doesn't, uh, that doesn't react 70, 80, 90, maybe 2%. Um, Although they make up, uh, argon is a noble gas that doesn't readily react with other chemicals. So argon sort of an inert gas. Think of it as a heavier version of helium. That's what it's like. Um, I wanted to include trace elements in our atmosphere that play a big role. Of course, we talk a lot about um, uh, global warming and carbon dioxide. I'm hoping to make that a part of today's lecture. You'll notice in grayscale here, I've put the percentages of uh, water and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And I think it's uh, important for us to label those. So let's write those down as well. So water clouds, or H2O, make up four-tenths of 1%. And then um, <clears throat> carbon dioxide, which plays a huge role <clears throat> in warming our planet, is 0.04%. Hey, Laura, how do I say that again? How do I say that number? Um, four hundredths of a percent? No. Yeah, yes. Yeah? Okay. Four cool. hundredths of one percent. Yeah. We'll never be intimidated by small numbers again. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> if we go back to Mars, Mars is pretty much the same thing as Venus. Um, just with a thin atmosphere. So CO2 makes up maybe 96%. I don't know here, let me, let me make sure I don't botch these numbers. Um, <clears throat> maybe 95%, 3% nitrogen and 2% argon. So I was just making sure. Okay, so you know we don't have to quibble over single percentages. You're just getting a sense that it's about the same, it's about the same composition as uh, Venus and then argon, maybe 2%. Now, before we go any further, let's just make sure that you guys have a conception of what these molecules look like. CO2, carbon dioxide, <clears throat> is one of the primary gases released by volcanism. In fact, what's the other gas that's most prevalent in volcanic outgassing? It's carbon dioxide and what other gas? That's a little test question for you here. Okay, while you think about that, let's take some extra notes here. Venus has a thick atmosphere. Earth has a medium thickness atmosphere by comparison. And Mars has a very thin atmosphere. So please remember that atmospheres are related to volcanoes or volcanism. Planets do not form with atmospheres ready-made. First of all, the proto-solar nebula, which formed our planet, 
was made up of hydrogen and helium gas <clears throat> with only 2% heavier elements. And secondly, when planets first form, they are so warm that their surfaces are probably molten rock and the temperatures are too high for gases to stick around on the planet. Maybe some gases, but the, the, the gases can, can escape over time. It takes billions of years of volcanic eruptions to fill up and produce an atmosphere once the planet has cooled down. And I'm trying to get you guys to think about which of these gases come out of volcanoes. I'll give you a hint. One of them is carbon dioxide. What's the other one? Nitrogen? Nitrogen does come out as well, but it's not the, the most abundant two gases are CO2 and... Is it argon? Argon is one of the, one of the gases that comes out of outgassing, but it's not the most abundant. Just look in your notes. If you can't remember things, we can't have an intelligent conversation because you guys will always be back to square one every time I try to talk. H2O. H2O. Okay, my friends, I can see one, two, three planetary mysteries staring me in the face when I look at these numbers. And maybe you know where I'm going with this. First of all, we can see that there's a lot of carbon dioxide on Mars and Venus. Now, remember students, when I showed you the interior structure of Earth, Venus, and Mars, if you layer them by density or by chemical composition, the planets look the same, more or less, on a large scale structure. Remember when I showed you this picture here? Planetary interiors and planetary surfaces are quite similar in terms of chemical composition. They've got silicate rock on the outside and they've got iron and nickel on the inside. Meaning that whatever volcanoes are going off on Earth, whatever volcanoes are going off on Venus, and whatever volcanoes used to go off on Mars, they were probably spitting out quite similar stuff. Yeah, there would be minute chemical differences because the planets are not exactly the same, but for the most part, they're gonna be pumping out the same gases. It's not like Venus is gonna spit out cotton candy and Mars is gonna be spitting out, um, you know, uh, potassium cyanide or something. These, are, these volcanoes are made of warm rock that are being powered by steam and CO2 jets. My point being, we've got a few planetary mysteries standing us in the face. First is, uh, it makes sense that I would see a lot of CO2 on Venus and Mars, but where, how did Earth end up with so little CO2? So this is, this is one of our planetary mysteries right here. Why does Earth have a dearth of carbon dioxide? I can see, Another planetary mystery. Another planetary mystery is how the hell did Earth end up with so much planetary oxygen? Oxygen is not um, a gas that is emitted from volcanoes. And that's because it's difficult to build up such a large quantity of oxygen. Oxygen is an explosive gas. It wants to react with things. It's amazing that we were able to pump up or build up so much of this O2 in our atmosphere, which we desperately need for life. Um, and I guess the third planetary mystery, can you guys see what the third planetary mystery is? Do you know where I'm going or? What else is weird if you consider the types of gases that come out of volcanoes? Venus and Mars don't have water. Yeah. If it, even, even Earth has only four-tenths of a percent, right? Which is kind of strange. Well, this is the atmosphere. Of course, Earth has massive oceans. So you could say that's part of the, that's part of the place where Earth's water is going to. But yeah, the water is missing from Venus and Mars. Now, you guys remember when we looked at the Mars topographical map, 
you can see that Mars, let's, let's call up, this might take a second here, but let's, we got time. Mars topographical, shoot. Okay, that's not what I wanted. Mars topographical map, yes. You guys will remember, oh, here we go. Let's keep this handy in case, in case we need this today. When you look at the surface of Mars, Mars clearly shows evidence that at one point liquid water flowed all across its surface. Um, if, you, if you look to where the Valles Marineris kind of empties out into the Chrissy Planitia, you can see that it basically, for all intents and purposes, resembles a giant river with all these tributaries that are flowing into an ocean. That suggests that at one point, Mars's entire northern hemisphere was covered in an in a ocean of water, and all of the continents were locked up in a kind of global Pangea in the southern hemisphere. But these are clearly, these are clearly dried up riverbeds here. They resemble riverbeds on Earth in, in, in every respect. We can't see your screen, just so you know. Oh, geez, guys, I'm sorry. I thought, uh, thanks, Jace. I thought I had shared my screen with you guys. Uh, all right, so while I was talking there, that <laughs> changes some things. Uh, here you can see the Valles Marineris, and you can see that the Valles Marineris kind of empties through all of these dried up riverbeds here into the Chrissy Planitia. Let me try to get the, the perspective perfect for you guys. So you can kind of see the big picture here. I should have opened this up in the PDF viewer. So you can see that all of, all of the Valles Marineris was probably at one point filled with water. That was part of our lab this week. And, and these tributaries flowed into a massive ocean, which probably covered the entire North Pole of Mars. There's a very good reason, uh, a sort of astronomy physics reason, why Mars would have had its water concentrated on its North Pole. It has to do with seasonal variations in Mars and its eccentricity. Maybe I'll come back to that. So what, what's the point I'm making? The point I'm making is clearly at one point there was water all over the surface of Mars, but it ain't there today. And Venus is similarly missing water. So that's our last planetary mystery is where the H2O at, okay? Okay, I want to tell you one more statistics that, uh, that I read in... Uh, in a more advanced uh, uh, book on planetary science that I think is a very important statistic to have in mind going forward. The atmosphere of Venus is hundreds and hundreds of times uh, thicker and more volumic than, than Earth's. And uh, one curious statistic that kind of drives this home that I think is interesting is that if you could go to Venus and take a giant atmosphere vacuum and just slurp up and suck up all of its 96% carbon dioxide, the remaining 3% nitrogen would be equal in mass and volume to Earth's 77% uh, nitrogen. So basically, this here, this is, it, it doesn't look like much because it looks like only 3% of Venus's carbon dioxide atmosphere. But this is like Earth's atmosphere with all of that extra gas dumped on top of it. Now, considering that planetary size is one of the fundamental properties of planets, I think it's strange that Venus's volcanoes could have pumped out all of this CO2, but all of that CO2 is not present on Earth. Like, Earth is a bigger planet than Venus. Why should Venus's atmosphere be thicker than ours? We should have the biggest atmosphere. But something's, something's happening, something interesting geologically, which has hidden all of our carbon dioxide. Does anyone know the answer to the, to the mystery of where Earth's carbon dioxide is located? I'm just curious if I'm telling you stuff that you already know or... Okay. That's okay. You're going to find out. All right. So what do we talk about when we talk about atmospheres? Uh, we have to start with a couple of basic concepts as usual, so that we can uh, go into this with the, with the right mindset. So let's think a little bit uh, about what it would be like if you could take a hot air balloon up through the atmosphere 
and slowly go from, from the ground level, uh, seafloor level, all the way up into outer space. Obviously, the atmosphere is being held to the planet by gravity, and the atmosphere is not necessarily going to have a uniform thickness, but rather, as you get higher and higher in the atmosphere, temperatures will change, pressures will change, and the density of air particles will change. I want to make one last point about atmospheres before I forget to make this point. Suppose you were an uh, interstellar alien and you took your spaceship and you arrived at Earth uh, for the first time to see if this planet was suitable for a takeover or something. And you just looked at the atmosphere with your alien eyeballs. What would you conclude is the primary gas constituent of our atmosphere based on the appearance of Earth? Like when you look at Earth and you see its atmosphere, maybe I need a better picture of Earth here. What is the first gas that you notice with your eyeballs? H2O. Yes. Okay, good. So you do understand me. Okay, yeah, H2O. You see water clouds. But what percentage of our atmosphere does water make up? Half a percent. What's the moral of that story? What you see is not what you get. Oftentimes, it is minor ingredients that make up small percentages of an atmosphere that are responsible for all of its appearance. Carbon dioxide is also a, an invisible gas. It, but Venus, when you look at its thick atmosphere, it's full of these thick yellow clouds. Those are all trace compounds that are making up the appearance of an atmosphere. Okay. So in any case, if we could take a hot air balloon up through this atmosphere, we can imagine measuring uh, the, the density and the pressure of gases to see how our atmosphere changes. At some point, we're going to end up in outer space. How high do you think you have to go before you get to outer space? How many kilometers up does the atmosphere go? It's kind of an awkward question, I guess, but I mean, 10, how tall is Mount Everest? 11 kilometers or is it no is it nine kilometers is mount everest right how high does an airplane fly 10 kilometers 11 kilometers there's still atmosphere up there the international space station is 400 kilometers above the surface of earth most people would consider the international space station to be in space but the iss has to make periodic corrections once a year it has to fire rockets to account for atmospheric drag. An atmosphere kind of never ends, just like there's no hard line between the, the water and the sand when you go to the beach. An atmosphere just kind of gets thinner and thinner and thinner until at some point you say, okay, this isn't cool anymore. I'm in outer space, all right? So let's remember that all of this is going to be governed by the ideal gas law. That's where I want to start uh, before we go forward. So let me erase these notes with everyone's permission. And let's do some good remembering about the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is a relationship between three properties that we want to understand to understand the physics of atmospheres. In your physics class, we write it as P equals NKT, where K is just a boring old constant called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Let's go ahead and just ignore the Boltzmann constant because that's not what I'm interested in talking about. I'm interested in talking about these variables, the pressure, the number density, and the temperature. I'm guessing you guys could use a little good remembering about what these parameters mean. P is the pressure of the gas. Class, what are our MKS units of pressure? Do you remember such things? Pascal. Nice. Pascals, which are the same thing as a Newton per meter squared. Um, N is kind of a weird one. N is the number density. And the number density is measured as particles 
per cubic meter. Where particles are not a real unit, so sometimes we just write it as one over meters cubed because particles are a concept rather than a physical measurable unit. Um, also, in our homeworks today, we sometimes use particles per cubic centimeter, or maybe next week we'll be doing that. Particles per cubic centimeter are sometimes used. Um, but the number density basically tells you, if you have a box, uh, how many atoms or how many molecules of air are floating around inside that box? This sample box that I've drawn, let's say I'm working in particles per cubic centimeter. A cubic centimeter is about the size of a chicken bouillon cube, right? So if you've got five gas particles bopping around inside your chicken bouillon cube, um, that's five particles per cubic centimeter. I believe the number density of air at sea pressure is something like 10 to the power of 21 particles per cubic centimeter. So basically the air that you're breathing, every chicken bouillon cube has a one followed by 21 zeros worth of air particles in it. Think about how stupid that is. Just think about in a little volume of space, the size of your fingers, just how many molecules are smushed into there. Lastly, we have T, the temperature. And the temperature in MKS units is always measured in units of Kelvin. To understand how we layer the atmosphere of Earth, you need to imagine how these parameters, pressure, density, and temperature, are going to change as you take a hot air balloon from the surface of Earth up into outer space. Obviously, there's only so high you can go in the atmosphere with a weather balloon, but uh, one can imagine taking some kind of a, a spacecraft up into outer space. Uh, okay, can I erase this? How are our note takers doing here? You're good, Kayla? Thomas is still laughing. Ernie's got the thumbs up. Okay. Jillian, you cool? All right, nice. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna imagine building a graph. Or, uh, it's gonna be called the, uh, the, I don't know, am I gonna start with pressure or am I gonna start with density? Let's see what my notes wanna do. My notes wanna start with density. Um, try and make a little graph with me called the density scale height. And bear with me here, because I'm gonna build this up and take you on a little journey. When we measure these properties of our atmosphere, we often make a plot where we use the y-axis as the height above the ground. And then we plot our parameter of interest, in this case density, on the x-axis. And if I were to start, start by plotting number density in particles per cubic centimeter, I'm gonna label the ground here as zero kilometers. And this is gonna be my height in atmospheres, uh, in my atmosphere in kilometers. So I'll go up, say, you know, here's 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers is about the height of Mount Everest or how high an airplane flies. And then we'll go up 20, 30, I'm gonna skip a few, 50 kilometers. And probably we can say we finally reached outer space by the time we get up to 400 kilometers. Now the density of air at sea level is something like 10 to the power of 21 particles per cubic centimeter. What do you think the density of air is when you get up to the International Space Station? Use your thinking caps here. What would the density of air be by the time you reach outer space? This is supposed to be a simple question, believe it or not. What's the density of air in outer space? Oh, shit. Someone didn't have coffee this morning, and I think that someone is all of you. Zero. 
Yes, thank you. The density in outer space should be here. It should be at zero particles per cubic centimeter. Okay? Because it's outer space and there's no air in outer space, right? Okay, just checking. Now, what's the point that I'm trying to make? Somehow, as we take our hot air balloon ride from the ground up into outer space, we have to go from this point, 10 to the power of 21 particles per cubic centimeter, to this point, zero particles per cubic centimeter. Now, I can imagine one of three ways in which that would happen. The first way would be a linear drop-off. In a linear drop-off, which I'll call scenario number one, the density of air would continue to drop proportionally the higher and higher I get in a planetary atmosphere. The second way I can imagine is what we might call an exponential drop-off. That's where the change is dramatic at first, and then it kind of asymptotes out to zero. So this is linear. Possibility two is it's exponential. And the third possibility is what we might call logarithmic, where it kind of doesn't change dramatically at first. And then logarithmic, I think I spelled all of these words correct. In a logarithmic scenario, it's sort of constant at first and then it drops off rapidly the closer you get to space. As you know, a scientist constructs various hypotheses and then performs experiments so that they can rule out false hypotheses and figure out which one better explain the facts. So I'm assuming you guys don't know the answer a priori. If I were to take a hot air balloon and measure the density of air from seafloor up to outer space, which of these curves do you guess would, most would best describe how our atmospheric density falls off? One, two, or three? Three. I got two. one vote for logarithmic. Are we all on board with that? Jay says exponential. Thomas is going with exponential. Okay, I can see some of your faces. Uh, Jillian's dark, but I think she's doing exponential too. Oh, some of you smarty pants. All right, and the answer is, let's take a look. This is the density scale high profile. Jillian and Thomas, you were correct. Now this graph is a wee bit different because it's measuring the density in kilograms per cubic meter. Apparently a cubic meter of air has 1.2 kilograms in it at C4 level. Class, if, if the air we're breathing, because Rhode Island is basically at sea level, is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter, by the time you get up above Mount Everest, you're at 0.4 kilograms per meter. What percentage of our atmosphere has been reduced by the time you get up to the top of Mount Everest? Or by the time you get to airplane height? 10 kilometers is more like 30,000 feet than it is at Mount Everest. <clears throat> if you go from 1.2 to 0.4, what, what fractional reduction is that? Four parts from 12. A third? Yeah, you only have a third of the atmospheric gas by density. So what I'm trying to say is, if you go up, if you were foolish enough to stick your head out the window during an airplane flight, okay, you, you would have one third the gas available to you that you had at the seafloor. By the time you go up to double airplane height, you've dropped to one twelfth. And by the time you get up to 30 kilometers, there's hardly anything left. But scientists continue to study the properties of atmospheric gases all the way out to hundreds of kilometers. Okay, if this is how the density falls off, how should we expect the pressure to fall off? If I played the same game with pressure, what do you expect the graph is going to look like? It's, it's going to stay exponential. It's going to stay exponential, says Jace. And let's find out if he's right. He's absolutely correct. We see another exponential drop-off. 
The pressure, as you know, at sea level is 100 kilopascals or 14.7 pounds per square inch. By the time I get up to airplane height, it's down to 20 kilopascals. So I've been reduced to a fifth of the atmospheric pressure. Here I'm at a tenth of the atmospheric pressure. And again, by the time you hit 30 or 40 kilometers, forget about it. There's nothing there left to huff, okay? What do you think is going to happen to temperature? How should the temperature drop as we get higher in our atmosphere? I'm looking at all your faces for insight. Same. Ernie says the same. And Ernie, normally I'd agree with you because the ideal gas law says that these quantities are all kind of proportional to each other. But Ernie, wouldn't you be surprised if you took your hot air balloon ride up into outer space and then you found that the temperature did this? Say what? First it drops, then it, oh, wait a minute. This, this graph is all messed up. Weird. I think that's because, hold on a second. Let me, oh, weird. Class it. I don't know how this happened, but I must have messed up this graph at some point. Okay, no, you know what? I'm just, I'm not used to, here, I see. Slide 13 is a better slide. Uh, th th that graph was missing a chunk and that threw me off for a second class, so forgive me. Uh, let me share my screen with you again. Let me get that slide up. Let's get this one, 13, function F5, 13. Take a look at what happens as you go up in, uh, in, in height or altitude in our atmosphere. The surface temperature of Earth varies depending on your latitude. Obviously, it's colder at the North Pole than on Earth. But I believe the global average temperature of Earth is about, what is it, uh, 15 degrees Celsius, or around 270-something Kelvin. First, as you go up to airplane height, the temperature drops, which seems reasonable. If you've ever seen pictures of people up at the top of Mount Everest, they got big, heavy gear on. It doesn't look warm up there at the top of Mount Everest. But surprisingly, as you get higher than Mount Everest, above airplane height, the temperature actually starts to rise again. And then it goes to this stratospheric bump, and then the temperature drops again, and then the temperature continues to rise and rise and gets hotter and hotter and hotter up into outer space. Understanding why temperature does this is the entire art of planetary science. You might consider this graph, which is known as the temperature scale height diagram, to be the entire thing of atmospheric science. And your book actually has a lovely information graphic, just a, a very beautiful moment where they, where they really get their illustration right. And they have a lovely depiction of this temperature scale height diagram that I wanna share with you in slide 25. This graph is cute and it, it also explains a whole bunch of things at once without having to do much work. So here's your height in kilometers. Um, it might be a little cut off on my, hold on, let me see if I can switch my bar over there. You can see our temperature in Celsius and we're starting off at an average of 15 degrees Celsius. And here you see, we're actually gonna define the layers of our atmosphere based on these switchbacks and fluctuations in temperature. The layer that you live under is called the troposphere, and that's where the majority of atmospheric gas is contained. Above the troposphere, you might have heard of the stratosphere before. The stratosphere is defined as that layer in which the temperature rises, it creates a stratospheric bump, and then it begins to fall again. After the stratosphere, you enter a layer called the thermosphere, sometimes it's known as the ionosphere, and this is where temperatures start to rise again, and then, Weirdly, in the exosphere, the tenuous, wispy outer layer of our atmosphere, the temperatures just get hotter and hotter and hotter. Now, that might seem strange to, strange to some students, that the temperature continues to go up and up and up all the way to space. Because most people naively think space is cold. That's like a concept that we sort of have lodged in our brain. But if you think about it, space isn't anything. There is no temperature in space. because well, students, how do we define temperature? What's the definition of temperature? 
Kinetic energy of a system of particles. Beautiful, Jace. The kinetic energy of a system of particles. And kinetic energy basically means velocity, right? Well, if there ain't no particles in space, then there ain't no temperature in space, right? Temperature doesn't make sense in a vacuum. However, the idea is we aren't going to be finding many particles of gas up here, but those ones that we are going to find, they're going to be moving pretty damn fast. Now, this does not mean that if you took off your space glove, your hand would feel warm. Your hand would feel really, really cold. Your perception of cold versus hot is not only about temperature, it's also about pressure. Even though these particles might have high kinetic energies, there are so few particles that there aren't enough to heat up your hand. Did we have the discussion about a, cooking a turkey versus in, in an oven versus boiling a turkey? That's where this comes into play here. This is like why boiling water hurts you more than uh, 400 degree air in your oven. There just aren't enough particles to deliver energy to your hand. So while it would feel cold, the actual temperature of the particles is quite high. Okay, I'm actually gonna burn a couple of moments of class and I think we should reproduce this in our notes. Because this scrap is of such importance, let's do it quickly. I'll kind of make use of my existing structure here. And remember, the name, this graph has a name in planetary science. This graph is known as the temperature scale height. And we're going to use it to define the layers of our atmosphere. I'm going to bring 50 kilometers down a little bit here. OK, we start off at an average temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. 15 degrees Celsius is the average temperature of Earth, okay? And so this is temperature in degrees Celsius. We are gonna drop as we get higher and higher in the troposphere, and then somewhere around 10 kilometers, we're gonna pick back up. Let's try not to screw this up. Let's get our stratospheric bump correctly. Uh, it looks like our stratospheric bump peaks around 50 kilometers. Okay, I did remember that appropriately. So it starts to rise. It goes back up. Somewhere around 80 kilometers, it drops. And then it gets higher and higher and higher as we go up into our atmosphere. Now, um, let's use this to define the layers of our atmosphere. The lowest layer... The one that we live under is the troposphere. The second one, which contains this bump, is the stratosphere. And this, by the way, is known as the stratospheric bump right here. It's considered an indication that a planet has life in it. Uh, then we have the area where it starts to get warm. This is our thermosphere. The thermosphere is so hot that some of the gases are ionized. And some people describe this layer uh, of Earth's atmosphere as being like a tinfoil hat. Uh, basically, you can bounce radio waves off of the thermosphere. That's how we deliver FM radio signals. And then lastly, a layer which I'm going to spend some time talking about today is the exosphere. The exosphere is that wispy outer layer where particles are just bleeding off into space. Now, to help reveal some of the mysteries of planetary science to you, let's just take a moment here to make sure you guys have that all down. I'm just going to look at your faces to see who's scribbling here. It looks like maybe Jace is writing. Angels in shadow. Jillian's done. Okay. All right, Thomas, give me the thumbs up. Thank you. Let me sit down with you, and let's take a look at our, our book's illustration together. One of the reasons why this is such a sick illustration is over here in the corner, it goes a long way to explaining why temperatures vary. It has to do with the different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum that the sun is supplying to Earth. Remember that the sun is sort of like a black body, and that means it gives off radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum. 
It's not just visible light. Visible light, our atmosphere is transparent to. So you know when you go out in a sunny day and it feels warm and you feel like the visible light of the sun is sort of heating up the air? That's actually not what's happening. Sunlight can heat up you because you, like the ground, are a dense object. But the air does not get heated up by visible light because the air is transparent to visible light. It passes through it. Visible light is absorbed by the ground and the ground rock becomes warm and it begins to glow like a black body. Black bodies that are warm in around 300 Kelvin, they tend to glow at infrared wavelengths, just like a human being does. And this infrared light from the ground is actually what heats up the air in the troposphere. Isn't that weird? The air around you is not being warmed up by the sun. The air around you is being warmed up by the earth. It's the earth radiating infrared light that heats up the air that you live in. That's a kind of weird concept. Now we have to talk about how this works. This is related to something called the greenhouse effect. And I wanna get into that at some point. Let's take a look at the stratosphere. The stratosphere is the layer that's being heated up directly by ultraviolet light. Normally, ultraviolet light would sort of be transparent to our atmosphere as well, but there is a trace compound in our stratosphere called ozone, which is really, really good at absorbing ultraviolet light. And most of the heating that you're seeing here is coming from interactions between ultraviolet light and ozone. Um, I don't suppose you guys know the chemical formula for ozone. But ozone is basically just O3. It's triatomic oxygen. Most of our atmospheric gas at the 21% level is diatomic, two atoms. However, here I'm going to need a little board space. During lightning storms and other random processes, it's occasionally possible to sizzle apart and break two oxygen atoms and get those oxygen atoms to sort of recombine in a sort of triforce molecule here. So imagine that you had three atoms of oxygen and they're all kind of connected by little springs. They make up something like, they're, they're so low in abundance that they're, you, you only find one ozone for every million air particles. So it's like 200 or 300 parts per million. But these ozone molecules are super, super good at absorbing ultraviolet light. So what happens is a UV photon comes in, it slams into your ozone, O3, and it busts apart this molecule into three oxygen atoms. Those three oxygen atoms then have really high kinetic energies and they go mosh pitting through the other air particles. And as these high kinetic energy oxygens slam into other air particles, they heat them up and they make the temperature go up. What's so cool about ozone is after the oxygen atoms have mosh pitted around and given their energy up to the surrounding air, they recombine and they come back together to form ozone again. So ozone is kind of like a bulletproof vest, or it's like a, a living force field or a shield that protects our planet from ultraviolet light. If it were not for that layer of ozone, which is only existing at the 300 parts per million particle level, the ultraviolet flux on the ground would be too high for any land, animals, or even plants to survive. You know that sunburn when you get at the beach? That doesn't feel good, right? That sunburn is the small percentage of UV light that actually gets through the bulletproof vest and makes it to the ground. If it weren't for ozone, the flux of ultraviolet light would be, well, I don't know the exact number, but it would be many times higher than it is today. Enough to just sizzle and burn your skin to a crisp. Okay, ozone is the reason why we have a stratospheric bump. So that stratosphere is connected to one of our planetary science mysteries. Where did Earth get all this damn oxygen? Maybe I should tell you the answer. Does anyone know where Earth got its oxygen? Oxygen doesn't come from volcanoes. Could it be the plants? Uh, yeah, 
That's right, kind of, but it's, uh, believe it or not, Kayla, um, plants only contribute a small one to 2% or 3% contribution to our planetary oxygen. Most of the oxygen on earth comes from cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. And since they make photosynthesis, it's kind of like plants, but they're not in the same kingdom, so to speak, right? So uh, you could cut down every tree on planet earth and we would still be able to generate plenty, I'm not that I'm suggesting we should do such a thing, but you'd still be able to generate plenty of oxygen just from blue-green algae, or what's known as cyanobacteria. These mats, which exist in ponds, lakes, rivers, and especially in the ocean, work like plants, and they convert uh, sunlight into uh, energy. And they uh, expirate, expirate? They, uh, whatever exhale is for cells, I don't know. They expirate, uh, car I'm sorry, uh, oxygen. They, they absorb CO2, and then they expirate uh, O2. And that's how our, our oxygen has built up over time. And why I think that's very fascinating, if you think about it, class, that literally means that life is not on Earth because Earth is the perfect place for life. Life exists on Earth because it formed here, and then life made Earth a better place to live. Consider this cool slide from one of my other, sh this is a slide from your book as well, but I think it kind of sums up the, the chain of events quite nicely in slide 33. Life began probably in Earth's oceans along those hydrothermal vents. Probably the initial organisms that formed would have formed along hydrothermal vents because you have all the right conditions for life. You have a hot energy source, which is the geothermal um, uh, extrusions from our, our uh, asthenosphere. You have this warm uh, boiling water. You're rich in all these nutrients. They are gonna be having complex chemical reactions. And at some point they're gonna form RNA or DNA or cells. You'd have to ask your biology professor about that. But at some point life develops along these hydrothermal vents and works its way up to the surface of the ocean. And when it gets up there, it says, oh, this is cool. I have another source of energy that I didn't think about before, sunlight. Maybe I'll develop some photosynthesis and I'll use that sunlight to create some energy. And as they, uh, uh, expirate uh, oxygen, oxygen starts to build up in our planetary atmosphere to the 21% level. Then ultraviolet photons and lightning sizzle apart some of that uh, O2 to create a thin layer of ozone, and the ozone becomes a shield in our stratosphere to protect us from UV light. And only then could plant and animal life develop on the land. So we weren't capable of living on the surface of Earth until life kind of made it perfect for us. We have literally terraformed our planet, and that means that life is part of the process of planetary geology. That's quite exciting because we know that there are many other planets out there besides our own, and who knows what kind of cool chemistry is going on there today, what other forms of life there might be. Okay, getting back to our slideshow, um, <clears throat> the next thing I wanna share with you is a discussion of the thermosphere and the exosphere. And then we're gonna do a couple of sample problems or something. Uh, let me function F525. Okay. You can see that the reason, oh, by the way, here, all right, let's have a thought question for the class. We have to keep our brains working. I understand why the temperature is rising in the stratosphere now. And that's because if ultraviolet light is heating up the air through ozone, the higher I get in my atmosphere, the closer I get to the light source, which is the sun. Class, why is there a bump? Why does suddenly the temperature begin to drop again? Can anyone work their imagination through that? The temperature here is, the temperature here, I forget you guys can't see my finger. The temperature here is rising because I'm getting closer and closer to where the sunlight, basically I'm getting closer to the sun and there's a higher flux of UV light. Why would it switch over and start to drop again? Is there less oxygen? That's right, Jason. As the density of air gets lower and lower, there are fewer of those ozone particles to absorb photons. 
So it's kind of like a calculus problem where here the particle density is dropping, but you're getting closer to the UV. And here it kind of switches over in the lack of ozone mo molecules are sort of uh, losing out and the temperature drops again. I should also point out that one of the things that makes the stratosphere very interesting is if you think about how air works in the troposphere or how air works in your home, we usually say that warm air rises and cool air sinks. And that sets up what are called convection cells. But in the stratosphere, the warm air is already sitting on top of the cold air. And that's how the stratosphere gets its name. The stratosphere is a stratified layer, almost like a layered cake, in which each slab of air on top of the lower one, each new slab of air is warmer than the one underneath it. For this reason, there is absolutely no convection in the stratosphere. And what that means is this is a very, very stagnant layer of our atmosphere. When chemicals, particles go up inside there, if chlorofluorocarbons get released, which can chew up our ozone molecules, maybe you heard about the hole in the ozone layer, which used to be a thing in the 80s and 90s. It has since recovered to some degree, but any chemicals like chlorofluorocarbons that get up into your stratosphere have a very hard time coming out of the stratosphere because there's no circulation or convective mixing to remove them. So once something ends up in the stratosphere, it's kind of stuck there for a while. Now in the thermosphere, the temperatures begin to rise again. And that's because now a new culprit starts to interact with our air molecules, X-ray photons. Remember that X-rays are very short wavelength and very high energy. So there's a cute little slide here, if I can go back one, showing you interactions between different wavelengths of light and uh, air molecules. A UV photon is capable of something called photodissociation. Photodissociation means you can break apart the molecule. In this case, they're showing a water molecule and they're knocking one of the hydrogens off. That's photodissociation. X-rays are so high energy, such short wavelength, that not only do they photodissociate air molecules, but they're also capable of ionizing the air molecules and kicking a little electron off. That means that the thermosphere is partially ionized because those X-ray bullets are just knocking the electrons right off of the molecules. This is what makes the thermosphere, it kind of contains a sublayer called the ionosphere. It's basically just a layer of plasma that's in our atmosphere. At the outermost layers where you get into the exosphere, the particle density becomes even too low for X-rays. X-rays do heat up your exosphere a bit, but now you actually start crashing into solar wind ions. Remember that the sun is giving off those charged particles like protons and electrons. Remember we talked about the aurora borealis? This is where particles from the solar wind are heating up our atmosphere here. And that means that atmospheres are constantly leaking away into space. By the way, I would be remiss if I didn't help take a moment to answer the question, why is the sky blue? I told you that visible light is, our air is transparent to visible light, and that's mostly true. The nitty gritty reality of it is that molecules of diatomic nitrogen and molecules of diatomic oxygen, they have a size of about, I don't know, one to 300 nanometers across. And that means they're a lot closer to wavelengths of blue light than they are to wavelengths of red light. So when, when uh, I don't know if I have a picture of it, this will have to do. When sunlight comes down to us through Earth, pound for pound, a lot more blue photons are being scattered or knocked into air molecules than the red photons are. And this tends to remove blue colors from the sun. If you think about the sun during the day, it looks kind of yellow. And that's because you're scattering blue photons. But these blue photons just don't go scattering over here to the left. They scatter back and forth and back and forth until the entire sky is glowing with a field of blue. So that blue sky that you see, those are all the blue photons that have been knocked out of the path of the sun and are just scattering willy-nilly all around the sky. In, in physics, we call it Rayleigh scattering. It has a one over wavelength to the fourth power dependence meaning the blue photons are much more strongly scattered than our red photons. If you think about looking at the sun during sunset, 
The sun at sunset doesn't appear yellow anymore, but it has a kind of orangish red color that you can see in this lovely photo of the beach. And that's because you have to look through a thicker column of atmosphere to see the sun at sunset, and pound for pound, even more blue photons are removed from the spectrum until the sun appears reddish. Remember class, what color is the sun from space? White. That's right. When you look at the sun uh, from the International Space Station, I keep choosing the wrong option here. Let's look at the sun from the ISS. As seen from outer space, as you can see in this photograph here, the sun is like pure white. It's the whitest white you ever did see. It only looks yellow because of that blue wavelength scattering that makes our sky blue. So this is what the sun looks like from space. It's pure white. By the time you're looking at the sun from the ground, it looks yellow, and at sunset, it looks red. And that's all because of that slight scattering of blue photons over red photons. OK, I just wanted to make sure we answered why is the sky blue before uh, this class ended here. Um, we're going to skip magnetic fields for now in Aurora, and we're going to do a little tidbit on sources and losses of atmosphere. Let me check my time. It's 1238. I could be doing better, but I think I've got time to get to one of my formulas. We're going to start at the top layer in the exosphere, and I want to introduce a, uh, a formula to you guys uh, that might be helpful. Shoot, I already forgot what page I'm at. Okay. Normally, I would take notes on this, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of talk you through it. Your book is a slide on how do planets gain atmospheres, and it looks like there's about three ways. The primary way, the way that's the most uh, important for developing an atmosphere is through outgassing. Where there are volcanoes, there are usually atmospheres. Where there are planetary atmospheres, there have to be volcanoes. Remember how big Olympus Mons was? Remember those big volcanoes, Pavonis Mons, Ascreus Mons? Those guys were probably uh, a big part of creating Mars's thin atmosphere. Um, you can also have either evaporation or sublimation. Evaporation goes from liquid to gas. Sublimation goes from ice to gas. This is very important on Mars today. Remember at the end of lab, Jace asked me about the Noctis Labyrinthus? And I showed you guys that dusting of carbon dioxide frost. And then I showed you another picture where the CO2 turns into gas and blows across the surface. That's showing you that Mars's atmosphere actually gains quite a bit of CO2, especially the ice caps. Mars's ice caps are part water and part CO2. And those, those ices sublimate into gas and add to Mars's atmosphere. If this one shouldn't have even been uh, included in the slide, in my opinion. On some planets, bombardment from solar wind can create trace gases. Believe it or not, there are some real nuts out there that make their living studying the quote unquote atmosphere of Mercury. There ain't no atmosphere on Mercury. The solar wind just crashes into the dirt and kicks off a couple of sodium or nitrogen particles that go bopping around the surface and then they jump off into space. But people are actually crazy enough to measure these, you know, super, super trace gases that, that exist around planets. So this might be important on Mercury, but obviously solar wind is not contributing to our atmosphere. Uh, there's only a couple of ways to gain atmosphere, either by evaporation or by outgassing, and mostly outgassing. But let me tell you, there are a lot of ways to lose an atmosphere. And this is the problem. This is the problem that Mars has today. Atmospheres don't just stick around. Over time, they bleed away into space and they get lost through a variety of processes. Obviously, if you get struck with a, a big impact crater, uh, impacts can kick gases off into space. Hell, impacts can even kick rocks off into space. Um, you can have chemical reactions with the surface. Remember that Mars is red because its oxygen at some point kind of rusted the surface red. Uh, you can have condensation. Um, condensation, of course, is going from a gas to a liquid. I wonder, what do we call it when we go from a gas to a solid? Any, I don't expect you to know the answer to this, but there's evaporation and sublimation. On the other side, there's condensation and anyone know what you call it to go from a gas to a solid? No. It's called deposition, deposits, okay? Here's the stuff that I wanna talk about before our class ends. I want to talk a little bit about solar wind stripping, but I also want to talk about this guy here, thermal escape. 
Atmospheres are leaky ships. They bleed away into outer space. And that's because you saw that at the top of the atmosphere, at the exosphere, particles' temperatures get higher and higher and higher. And at some point, they're going to be high enough to achieve escape velocity and just jump right off the surface of our planet. Atmospheres also get harassed by the solar wind, which sends high-speed protons and electrons on violent collision courses, on kamikaze collision courses with our atmospheric gas particles. We need a way to describe the loss of atmospheres so we can kind of come up with a science of when do atmospheres get lost? What is the criteria for a planet to keep its atmosphere? And we know quite a bit about this because we know quite a bit about how gases behave when they bop around with each other. So uh, let me just take a moment here. Uh, that's slide 37. And let me go back to my picture of the ideal gas. 37 and 7. Okay, look at these air particles here. Um, Earth's atmosphere is 77% diatomic nitrogen, 21% diatomic oxygen. So let's say that the blue pellets are like the nitrogen particles, and let's say that the red pellets are like the oxygen particles. Let us follow around one of the oxygens and watch what's happening to it. You'll notice it's undergoing so many collisions per second that sometimes the gas particle is moving slowly and sometimes the gas particle is moving fast and its velocity keeps changing. We need a method of describing how fast these particles are moving and that's kind of irritating because even one particle is constantly changing its velocity. But we can do statistics on the gas and we can attempt to measure what is the sort of distribution of speeds. How many particles are moving slow, medium, and fast? The distribution of speeds is not smooth. There are not equal numbers of particles going slow, medium, and fast. The distribution in nature obeys something called, and this is where we're going to get a little techie here, guys, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds. For some reason, all gases, once they start smashing into each other, they tend to follow a curve that's kind of like the bell curve, but it's, it's not the bell curve. It's nature's own particular statistical distribution, and nature made it up, so you have to ask her why she did this. I couldn't tell you. But particles follow the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. It's kind of like a bell curve. There's a sort of average or most probable speed shown here. This means the greatest number of particles, let me annotate here with a friendly magenta color. So you can see here that there's a speed called the, the thermal speed. This is where the greatest number of particles are traveling at this velocity. But there's also the presence, and this is very important. That's supposed to be an arrow, by the way, but I can't draw on this damn thing. This is called the high speed tail. The high speed tail means there's kind of a few more gas particles. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. There's just a few more gas particles which are traveling at fast velocities than there are at slow velocities. And one of the reasons why that's important is at some point you're going to rub up against the escape velocity of the planet. Let's imagine that your escape velocity is here. So normally I do these as notes, but I'm kind of out of time. Uh, this is your escape velocity. And any particles, sorry, I'm still learning the mechanics of this drawing thing. Any particles that travel faster than your escape velocity, all of these gas particles up here, they're going to be in danger of escaping into space. OK, now it's time for us to do just a teensy bit of math. Let me erase this nonsense. Let's end our, our share screen. And let's take a couple of notes here. OK. So we're taking a trip to the exosphere. And the exosphere is the layer of Earth's atmosphere where 
gas particles can bleed. We'll just say, oh man, my, my marker is really getting kicked here. Can bleed into space. Okay. And we want to come up with a condition for atmospheres being lost to space. Um, the gas particles follow something called a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Uh, I really need to find a bit of black marker if you guys are going to have any hope of seeing this. Okay. And the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which looks like this, it's a plot of velocity versus number of particles. It looks like a bell curve with a high-speed tail. We want to take a moment to talk about this velocity right here. This is something called the thermal speed. The thermal speed is if I have to pick one velocity that characterizes my gas, I'm going to choose the velocity that's the most likely velocity, the one that has the greatest number of particles traveling at that speed. And there is a formula that describes this thermal speed. I have to teach it to you. Hold on a second, class. Sorry, class, it makes you really appreciate all those hardworking folks at CCRI that keep our classrooms clean because these boards get real icky. And I've got to remember to clean this thing off every day or it's, it's going to kill my markers. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, let's learn about the thermal speed. Oh, I think I still have some Windex on here. VTHM will stand for our thermal speed. The thermal speed characterizes how fast gas particles travel in an atmosphere. And the formula is related, obviously, to the temperature of the gas. The higher the temperature of your planetary atmosphere, the faster the gas particles go. And the thermal speed is a cute little formula that goes 2 times k, k is the Boltzmann constant, times the temperature, divided by the mass of your gas particle. Little m here is the mass of the gas particle. Let's try to do a sample problem and then I'll, I'll end the class. Oh man, let's do a very hasty sample problem just to have you guys try it out. Let's pick diatomic oxygen and let's imagine an oxygen molecule in the exosphere of Earth and see if it can escape. Hold on a second, I'm, I'm fighting my messy board here. Note to self to do this before class next time. Okay. Okay. So this will be our last operation before we do our homework. So we'll do a sample problem. Let's imagine diatomic oxygen in the exosphere and we'll give it a characteristic temperature of 300 kelvin just to keep it simple okay now a good number to remember is that the mass of a hydrogen atom is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms 
the reason why I'm writing down the mass of a hydrogen atom is because a hydrogen atom is just one proton. And protons and neutrons weigh the same. So you can basically figure out the mass of any other gas particle by knowing how many nucleons it has. Class, what's a nucleon? Who understands my words? Proton or neutron. Great, okay. So Jace, do you know how many uh, protons and neutrons there are in a typical oxygen atom? Or anyone? What's the atomic number of oxygen? Periodic table of elements, Sergeant Welsh. Where's the big one? That's not a big one. Well, that's okay. I guess not everyone's had a chemistry class. I believe it's eight protons and eight neutrons. Let's look here. Typically, eight protons and eight neutrons because it's oxygen 16. So how many times do I have to multiply hydrogen to get one oxygen, one diatomic oxygen? 16. Times 32. two. 32, right. So if I do 32 times the mass of hydrogen, I get the mass of O2. Um, I'll punch that up quickly because we're running out of time here. Uh, I brought my calculator over before class started. Here it is. Nice. Okay, so 32 times 1.7 exp27 negative. So that's 5.4 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's plug in all the components to our thermal speed and just do a cheesy little calculation, okay? So the thermal speed is two times the Boltzmann constant, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin, times 300 Kelvin, divided by 5.4, times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Can you guys take your calculators and just so I feel like I gave you the squeeze at one point today, just, just punch that up and then we'll, we'll end the damn class. Sorry, there was a little bit of hiccups there with me wrestling with the chalkboard. I got 400. What would the units be? meters per second. That's right. So for oxygen in our exosphere, we're traveling at 400 meters per second or only 0.4 kilometers per second. Now Earth's escape velocity is 11 kilometers per second. Can oxygen escape into space from our exosphere? Not at the thermal speed anyways. But remember, Jace, the problem is just a little bit more complicated than that. Because as you'll remember, not all gas particles are traveling at the thermal speed. Some of them are up here in the high speed tail. And there will always be a few which are traveling fast enough to bleed away into space. My last note for you is that there is a condition for atmospheric gas loss that I have to cover with you. Um, I don't know why everything's going to crap on me here today, but, oh, here's my eraser. I think I understand why my board is getting so icky now. It's this yucky, nasty eraser. Okay. The condition for atmospheric loss goes something like this. If the thermal speed 
is greater than or equal to one fifth of your escape velocity, then the gases are lost over a geological time scale. Now this might not sound super interesting, but the fact is this is why Mars has a thin atmosphere which is slowly getting bled away into space today. There's no more active volcanism to replenish the particles that are achieving thermal escape and getting lost into space. You know, in this TV show that I like to watch about the solar system called The Expanse, all of the Martians are obsessed with terraforming Mars and creating an ocean on Mars. Guess what, Martians? It ain't never gonna happen because your volcanoes are dead and these gases are gonna keep leaking away into space and you don't have enough surface pressure for water. So you ain't gonna get your ocean in Mars. The only way to change Mars would be to add more mass to the planet, which I think would be, you know, that's outside of the jurisdiction of human beings' technological abilities. Maybe, anyways, you'd have to double the mass of Mars to get it to have enough mass to, to hold on to its atmospheric gas. Obviously, Earth is a big fat planet, so Earth doesn't have that problem. Even if you took one fifth of our escape velocity, one fifth of 11 kilometers per second is something like, what, 2.5? Yeah, or 2.2 kilometers per second. So even though our even though our we only uh, even though gas particles would need to have a thermal speed of 2.2 to escape, at 300 Kelvin, oxygen is still firmly bound by the gravity of Earth. In other words, you don't have to worry about oxygen bleeding away into space and you suffocating. It's not going to happen over the next hundred million years. So you should be all set. Okay. Anyways, that's the end of our lecture today. Let's. We are going to do a homework sesh today. And uh, I want to make sure that it's up there because last week I forgot to put it in. Uh, if I go to my Blackboard, do you guys have a homework for this? Aha. Uh -huh. This is what we want here. Today we're going to be doing homework number nine, chapter nine, 48, 55, 57, 59, and 60. Can you guys write those numbers down real quick? I've got the questions right there. So. Let's take a little tea break and then we'll come back. Uh, oh shoot, it's already one, damn it. Let's just take a quick five minute pause and then we'll come back uh, and do our homework. Sound like a plan? <laughs>